Maker, beautiful worker, promise keeper. That is who we, he is, our God. He is the way, the truth, and the light. Amen. We thank you so much. Just a few announcements this morning. Uh, Jerry's class on Wednesday, we'll be watching The Chosen. On Thursday, Dave will be having a young adults and actually, couples class. Actually, Thursday night. We are going to be at the uh, Central Christian Church, 7 p.m. Should be in your bulletin, but we've got the um, National Day of Prayer service for the community. We invite you out to be a part of that. I'm supposed to be in charge of it, so I could use your support. Go ahead. Okay. Thanks. <laughs> uh, you're welcome. So, yep. So, Central Christian, 7 o'clock, National Day of Prayer. Uh, remember our camp sign up for our kids and also adults. There's a lot of adult classes that go on at camp too. Uh, we'll be honoring our graduates on May 21st. Um, so please contact the office if you have a graduate that's be graduating. Uh, Cruise on the Ridge is coming up. Uh, there'll be a sign up sheet for that next week for those who'd like to either help out on the day of the cruise or donate baskets or things to be raffled off, car things to be raffled off I should say. And our pavilion fund has been met. We have met the goal for the construction of it, and now we're, the remaining funds will go towards the landscaping and refabbing the playground with some new equipment. So lots of things going on. Uh, check your bulletin also, and let's open in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we are so, so thankful that you are the way. We have to come through you, Lord, but the love that comes is so great. Lord, we just lift you up every day. Lord, as we wake up in the morning, before our feet hit the floor, we just say thank you. Thank you for another day. Thank you for a chance that we can reach out and spread your love to those that we meet through the day. Lord, be with our service today. Watch over us. Be with Dave as he brings a message. And Lord, we just thank you. We just thank you for the way. 
In his name I pray, amen. Would you please stand and sing with us? Where you go, I'll go. Where you stay, I'll stay. When you move, I'll move. I will follow.
Your grace abounds in deepest waters. Your sovereign hand will be my guide. Where feet may fail and fear surrounds me, you've never be seated. Our scripture today comes from the book of John, starting with chapter 6. Jesus answered, very truly I tell you, you are looking for me, not because you saw the signs I performed, but because you ate loaves and had your fill. Do not work for food that spoils, but for food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. For on him God the Father has placed his seal of approval. Then they asked him, what must we do the works of God requires? Jesus answered, the work of God is this, to believe in the one he has sent. Then the Jews began to argue sharply among themselves, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? Jesus said to them, Very truly I tell you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. 
Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will rise them up at the last day. From this time, many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. You do not want to leave too, do you? Jesus asked to the twelve. Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and to know that you are the Holy One of God. Thank you, Shelley. You know, I just noticed this is last week. I didn't see it before, but there is a, a road sign out here that says to East 62. Anybody notice that? I, I like to live. It's right in my front yard. I never really noticed it. I walk past it every day, in fact, when I take my morning walk, my after, actually my evening walk, but uh, I never noticed it. You know, it's funny how some things just kind of pop out at you. I should notice it because I've lived off of US 62 for several years, lived on the top of Chestnut Ridge Road when I grew up. I'm now here in the Parsonage, so that's a good half of my life. I've lived on 62. Also, when I was in Utica, Ohio, I lived right off of Route 62. When I was in Millersburg, Ohio, right off of Route 62. Don't you think that I deserve a Route 62 sign to take home and hang in my den? I don't really have a den, so I guess I couldn't hang it there. Maybe my bedroom, but my wife would probably not. <laughs> she would probably protest to that. However, let me ask you a question. Do you know which route sign is most commonly stolen uh, in the USA and Canada? The most commonly stolen route sign. How many of you think it's good old Route 66 out west, straight out through Arizona? Yeah, a lot, probably a lot of them out there, right? A lot of people steal that sign. But uh, per number of signs that there are out there, it's actually Route 666. Now, why would anybody want to steal the Route 666 sign? I don't understand, do you? I wouldn't want to steal Route 6. You know, there are quite a few highway 666 is out there and in most instances they're known as the devil's that's right the devil's highway you go out west right off of route 62 actually connects the states of utah and new mexico is a 200 mile road called route 666 and they say it's haunted they do they say truck drivers will drive and they say sometimes uh, they see a woman appears in white and then disappears i don't know about that i think the devil's got us the devil's got a uh, an alert mind uh, some say there's a haunted truck they'll pass and other truckers have arrived at their destination the rest stop right after Route 66, 666, and they don't even remember taking it. Uh, how many of you know we have a Route 666 right here in the state of Ohio? It's down south. It's, it's uh, down in the Zanesville area. It kind of, it, 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 you pass Zane Casket Company. And then it winds along the Muskegon River, and it ends up in a place called Dead Man, Ohio. <laughs> now, tell me that was by accident. Uh, and people say, of course, it is haunted. In fact, someone uh, said this about it. Someone said, it's an evil road. The S-bend under the pass looks absolutely deadly. I think it's cool that it ends at a bridge like that. Very Ichabod Cranish. <laughs> Interesting, isn't it? You know, there's a Route 666 over in Pennsylvania, too. Hi, Sutton. <laughs> Hi, Sutton. How are you? There you go. Beautiful, beautiful baby. Uh, Route 666, Pennsylvania. They say it's a blessed highway, not a cursed highway, because evidently a Moravian minister, a Moravian missionary, camped there once back in the late 1700s on his way out east, and he blessed the highway. Therefore, it's known as a blessed highway and not a haunted highway. If you happen to run into that Route 666, you'd probably still steal the sign regardless, right? And they do call it Devil's Highway. But if you open your Bibles, don't get excited. I'm not, pre I'm not preaching out of Revelation. But if you open your Bibles to Revelation chapter 13, I want you to know that's the most prominent time that the number 666 appear in the Bible. But they also appear another time uh, back in the Old Testament as well. Did you know that? Uh, but this morning, think about that Route 666. You think about uh, the number 666 corresponds with it's the number and the name of the beast in Revelation. You know that, right? 
Uh, and as a matter of fact, since the Hebrews, they don't have an alphabet, and the, the Bible's written back then in Hebrew, they didn't have an alphabet. They counted by, or they had an alphabet, uh, they were only consonants. They counted by those continents, they, consonants. They didn't have a numbering system. So when written in Hebrew, each letter possessed a numerical value. So the number 666 actually added up to the name Nero Pharaoh, or Nero Pharaoh, Nero Caesar. Nero Caesar. That's interesting, isn't it? That number 666. Oh, now Miles is going to get in on it, huh? Now we got Miles, all right. So let, let, let's uh, uh, take a leap. Verse 18, Revelation chapter 13, verse 18, John uh, tells us that, um, you know, these, these things, he says, uh, we, we need to, uh, we, we, uh, wisdom, he says, wisdom is necessary. He said, wisdom is necessary. That's a hint. That's a hint as I think about the reference in the Old Testament to 666. Because in the Old Testament, it corresponds to an amount of money annually that was given to Solomon, the king. 666 talents of gold. Now, remember what Solomon was into, all right? We know that Solomon was the wisest man ever. The guy had been known for his great wisdom, but he became forgetful of God after a while because of the immense wealth that he had amassed for himself. So Solomon had been into what? Gold, gals, gold, gals, and glamour, right? All of his life, gold, gals, and glamour. That's Solomon. So now take the hint, all right? He, he was wise, but then he went for all those other things. He took a different route. And so if you think about it, the mark of the beast then in Revelation is intended to force believers to make a choice. Now, a long way to get to that point. Revelation, the, the mark of the beast, number 666, is there to make believers make a choice. Uh, we have to decide which highway we want to take. Do we want to take Route 66 or do we want to take Route 6? 66. That's the question I ask today. In fact, that's the question Jesus would ask of us too. Because if we open up our Bibles and go to the Gospel of John, we're going to find that Jesus is asking through this passage, uh, he's asking disciples to make a choice. Now, remember last week we talked about from Luke chapter 4, Jesus had a mission. And what was his mission? He was to go to the, he was to go to the poor. He was to go to the captives. He was to go to the blind. He was to go to the oppressed. Uh, all of those groups of people are what? Typically characterized as uh, underprivileged, okay? So Jesus went to those kind of people, not only physically, but spiritually speaking, people like you and me, people who were destitute, down on life. Uh, and so in that culture that Jesus preached in, now keep in mind, John 6 is also the feeding of the 5,000. So in the culture that Jesus preaches in, uh, it, they were hand-to-mouth people. That means that their, their very existence depended upon how much money they brought in that day. So these people weren't concerned about wealth. They were concerned more about food. Uh, and so that day by the Sea of Galilee, Jesus provided miraculously and wonderfully a banquet for these people to enjoy when their tummies were, were hungry. Isn't that cool? Jesus provided food for them to be nourished by. That's important as we look into this. Uh, but uh, more to it than that, um, it was like an all-you-can-eat seafood buffet by the Sea of Galilee. They had never, ever before eaten all you can eat. They never before had that kind of luxury. And so the next morning, they went away satisfied, the Bible says. But the next morning when their hunger pains returned, guess what? They all jumped in their boats and they headed out on the Sea of Galilee uh, to hunt Jesus down in Capernaum. Uh, why? Because, well, they were hungry. They thought he'd feed them again. And when they arrive there, they're pretty disgusted. And when they find out the title of his next sermon, the title of Jesus' next sermon was, Eat My Flesh and Drink My Blood. Now, that would be enough to nauseate any of us. I mean, if I uh, was to have that as a title of one of my sermons, Eat Dave's Flesh and ding Drink Dave's Blood. Now, come on, you wouldn't be that anxious to beat the, the Baptist to the buffet, would you? Eat, eat Dave's flesh, drink Dave's blood. But that's exactly what Jesus said. It had to be the worst sermon he had ever preached from John chapter 6. The worst sermon he'd ever preached. Uh, and uh, 
the, the key here leads to our key verse is actually John chapter 6, verse 66. Do you see it? John chapter 6, verse 66. All right, so actually the 666 appears in the Bible how many times now? Three times, not just twice, not, not once, but three times. John 6, 66, because of this, many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. That's, that's really important to understand. If Jesus had been the preacher of an emerging Galilean congregation, there would have been serious accusations raised against his ability to keep a congregation together. I mean, think about that. He managed to whittle his church down from 5,000 in attendance to 12 in no time at all. Uh, I'm sure there would have been a lot of people calling for his resignation in that church in Galilee. Don't you think? Uh, Imagine uh, other churches wouldn't have been standing in line waiting to call Jesus to their their ministry either? Like if if you interviewed Jesus, you'd say, Jesus, how'd things go in your last congregation? And Jesus would say, well, I did pretty good. He said, I I managed to whittle out the riffraff of unbelievers and our attendance dropped from 5,000 to 12 in a matter of days. Now, come on, you know, (laughs) it's not going to bring much much in the way of, of uh, excitement, isn't it, for the church board interviewing him? So, so that's the deal. When we come into John's gospel, uh, John 6 is one of those mile marker passages in the Bible that separates the casual fan from the devoted follower. One thing on our journey, we're all on a journey, right? We're all on, we call it the Christian life, the Christian walk. Uh, While we're on our journey, stop and think about it. This thing called dismay is going to settle in. And we may be talking about disappointments, doubts, discouragement. But when dismay sets in, we want to turn away. Hey, think about it. What's coming the month of May? April showers bring. We hope, right? We hope good things are ahead in May, things that will encourage us. But maybe not. We don't know what's out there on the horizon next Uh, Maybe you're going to be going through a particular trial in your life. Maybe some undue stress or pressure coming your way. Uh, Maybe a domestic crisis. We don't know. Dismay is often characterized by a lack of faith and trust in the Word of God. Dismay is often characterized by a lack of faith and trust in God's Word. And it can either be a discipline for us or it could be a discouragement. It could be a disease. Depends upon how strong our faith is. Like I, I was right up here on this stage several years ago, and I was doing the wedding for my niece uh, a- Angie Coxon, who uh, was marrying uh, a, a, her husband was Jason. And uh, Jason had invited his uncle also to preside in the service. And his uncle was a Methodist preacher going way back. And he told me, he said, when I preach, I tell my people, I'm going to give them one of three things. Usually I'm going to give them, he says, when I preach, it's like a steak dinner. Now I wanted to say, you know, when I preach, it's more like a chicken dinner. But he said, when I, when I preach, it's like a steak dinner. And he says, I'm going to give people meat. All right, they're going to get the meat from God's word. Uh, and if you, you like that lean meat, you're going to grow and you're going to be nourished. Uh, on the other hand, some of what I give them is going to be like gristle and fat. Uh, and they can chew on that just a little bit if they want to. And they could either swallow it or spit it out because that's my opinion. I'm going to give some opinions when I preach. I'm going to give a chicken dinner occasionally. I'm going to give steak when it comes from the word of God. But then he says, I'm going to give them one more thing, and that's bone. I'm going to give them a bone to chew on. What's a steak always have? A good bone, right? And he said, bones are going to, that's when the Holy Spirit comes in. And when the Holy Spirit comes in, he convicts your heart. Uh, And so a lot of people say, I don't want any bone. I'd rather have no bone, preacher. And that's the point that he was trying to make is that, yeah, you know, the Holy Spirit shows up in preaching and people are convicted. But the point is, many disciples say, no bone, please. There are three possible routes we can take when we get dismayed. Three highways we could travel down. The first highway is what I want to call deserter's highway. The second highway, drifter's highway. And the third highway uh, is what we're going to call determinator's highway. So let's go to the first highway. The first highway is what we call Defector's Highway. Defector's Highway is often for those who only come to Jesus long enough to be fed. We come to Jesus long enough to be fed. Look down at verse 26. Verse 26, For my Father's will is that everyone who looks to the Son and believes in Him shall have eternal life. 
and I will raise him up in the last days. So to most people, the feeding of the 5,000 was just another reason to invite someone out for an evening of entertainment, a sideshow, and maybe if you were lucky, dinner on the grounds, right? That's all, it, that's all it was to many. But when Jesus' teaching got harder, the Bible records here in John chapter 6 that many people turned back. And it still happens today, doesn't it? Some people follow Jesus just long enough to get fed. Some people follow Jesus just long enough to uh, have him approve of their lifestyle or however they're, they're living their life. Some people come to Jesus just for what he can give. And yet when a tough word comes and challenges their lifestyle, they quickly turn away. Several years ago, I had the opportunity to go down to the Windward Island School of Evangelism. It's located in the West Indies on a little island called St. Vincent. While I was there, I got to work with Bob and Jackie Muter, very devoted missionaries. They're both deceased now, I think. Jackie might be still with them. But nonetheless, uh, Bob was a devoted preacher. And you understand that those islands are always under the influence of uh, like West Indian tra traditions and superstitions. And so their main religion was voodoo. Uh, and then that was uh, also a, uh, something that was tried to, uh, missionaries tried to replace it with a very strict Roman Catholicism. So when you blend the two of those things in, there was a lot of mysticism. People came to church hoping for a mystic blessing of some sort. Well, on the particular Sunday that I was there, one of the two, Bob was blessing babies, all right? He had a uh, rose for, for newborn babies. And the mothers actually have a bed and give the baby the rose, but he gave it, you know, I don't think the baby would want the rose, but that the, the mother would, right? And so he's blessing. And as he's giving his blessing, this one young woman comes along. Her name was Naomi. And apparently Naomi now had had her third child, never married, never married, third child by three different men. And she had come before to the church for a mystic blessing. Uh, now, I would have sugarcoated things. I would have said, oh, what a what a lovely mother, and what a beautiful baby. And I, we just uh, thank God for the, the new, new, newborn, new life. Uh, and, and uh, you know, I, I pray that, Naomi, you would do a good job at raising him uh, based on, on Scripture. But Bob came at it a little differently with a little, uh, little bit more wrath in his voice. He said, Naomi, you would by now have learned a valuable lesson from God's mercy and grace. Though this child was conceived in sin, he said, God is gracious. Now you must do a better job to set an example for your children in the future. And I kind of thought, how many Americans would have chewed him up and spit him out? That was back in the 1980s. Think about that. That was back in the 1980s. Uh, and yet uh, this young woman uh, understood that it wasn't just a man talking to her. Uh, it was the power of the word of God. Uh, it was the, 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 the power of the church. And I think we need to restore that more and more. The power and the authority of the church and the word of God uh, to our lives, to our families, to our homes, to our culture, to our society. Uh, there's power in the word of, of, of God. Now, how many here have ever had a, a word from God where maybe it just made you a little, bit of, a little bit uncomfortable? How many find that some of the bone tough sayings of the Bible might contradict the way you're feeling at the time? You know, God comes along and says something, um, you're, you're at work and somebody else at work is being hard on you. Maybe you feel like your employer's taking advantage of you. Whatever, anybody had that situation before? What do you want to do? You want to lash out at that individual, don't you? But then you stop and you read the word of God and the word of God says, for I tell you, do not resist an evil person. If someone strikes you on the right cheek, turn to him what? The other cheek as well. So, you know what I'm saying? Does that mean that I should accept abuse from other people? Of course, of course not. What Jesus is saying is that, hey, I got to keep in mind, I'm, I'm the Christian. I'm the mature one. I'm trying to win that person to Christ. I have to be careful how I interact with other people in my place of work. How about when your marriage is on the rocks? When you and your spouse haven't spoken in a couple of weeks, you know? And maybe you're looking at the grass on the other side. It looks a little bit greener than it did the day before and more green than the day after. 
the day after. And you're thinking, you know what? Uh, I, I just might want to get out of this thing. In Matthew 5, 32, you read in the Bible where Jesus says, but I tell you that anyone who divorces his life except for marital unfaithfulness causes her to become an adulteress. How do you feel? How do you feel when Jesus says harsh things like that? When he says, unless you sell everything you have and follow me, you can't be my disciple. Wow. I don't want to sell everything I have. I don't think he expects me to. But he wants me to devote myself totally and completely to, to, to him. And, and, and so there, there are some things to note about Jesus' hard sayings. With a word, he's able to weed out the defective from the devoted. Uh, so if you're feeling defective, you might not be far from defecting, right? And so the, the answer, the question is this, are we going to defect or are we going to devote? Are we going to be defective or are we going to dedicate to him? What is it, what's one thing in your life that could devastate you right now? What's one thing in your life that could cause you to be a defector and to walk away from this relationship you have with Christ so that you would be lost? Everybody probably has one or two things in their life. Everybody probably has one or two things. So, um, the, 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 so the first highway you might take is defector's highway. The second highway that you might take is drifter's highway. Are you a, a drifter? And so Jesus is, uh, as the defectors are defecting, Jesus turns to his disciples with a question that they would need to contemplate. His question, you don't want to leave me too, do you? You don't want to leave me too. I don't think he's whining here. I don't think he's saying, you don't leave me. I think he's asking him a serious question to contemplate. Do you want to leave me too? Because these other uh, 4,000, uh, you know, 988 people have left. You don't want to leave too, do you? And, and drifters are those who follow Jesus until they get fed up. Remember? Defactors or defectors are those who follow Jesus long enough to be fed. Drifters follow Jesus long enough till they get fed up. Judas Iscariot would be the best example of a drifter. Stop and think about it. Judas wanted nothing more than to have Jesus play his hand. He, he thought Jesus by now would have asserted himself as God's Messiah, would have been ready to take on an army and overthrow Rome. When that didn't happen, Judas became a defector. He got fed up. He got fed up with Jesus. Uh, Paul had a, a uh, co-worker by the name of Demas. The Bible said Demas loved the, ch loved the world. He loved the world. He got fed up with the church because he loved the, because he loved the world, right? So unfortunately, there, there are many modern examples of this as well. Some people get fed up with people in the church. You know, we get fed up with uh, some leader who made a decision we didn't agree with. Some people get fed up with the church and they walk away. Some people get, get fed up because they see other believers blessed and they're not. Other people get fed up when they see the church grow, when they see numbers coming and increasing. The average person is comfortable in a church of about 70 because that's exactly how many people we can get to know the names of and you know, we can get to know on a first name basis. We're comfortable with that. Uh, there, there are others out there who get frustrated with change when change begins to happen. I talked to a young minister the other day who had just taken on a new role as a new minister and he asked his congregation, uh, his leaders, what, what did they do to make an impact in the community? And one guy said, well, we have, for the last 50 years, we've held an annual sauerkraut and pork dinner. And he said, we've managed to grow our attendance down 300 to 50. So what's happening with that, right? Well, how many of you get excited about a sauerkraut and pork dinner? I, I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't be excited about that. But, uh, you know, evidently there were, <laughs> there was a reason enough to keep that dinner around. So Jesus said, don't work for food that spoils but for food that endures to eternal life. Maybe drifting away is our, our, our greatest danger. What about the pandemic? If you look around and see how many people no longer attend church that attended church before the pandemic. Now, there are a lot of people who probably attend church now that didn't before the pandemic, and that's a good thing. But there are many people who no longer attend church after that little shakeup we call the, 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 the pandemic. You know, if Judas could be in Jesus' presence for three years and still get fed up and drift away. 
we stand in danger of drifting as well. Hebrews chapter 2, verse, verse 1. Therefore, we must pay closer attention to what we've heard, lest we drift away from it. So how do I keep from being a drifter? How do I keep from being a drifter? Well, let me, let me read this key verse from verse 39. And, and this is the will, Jesus said, of him who sent me, that I shall lose none of all that he's given me, but that I shall raise them up in the last days. Look, I want to get as close to Jesus as I can. I want to be a gripper. <laughs> I want to grip hold of Jesus. I don't want to be a drifter. I want to be a gripper. And that's what Jesus is alluding. In fact, three times here, uh, he says, I will raise him up in the last days. Four key words here. Four key words uh, for not, if you don't want to be a drifter, pay attention. Four key words. The first one is look. The second one is believe. The third word uh, is, is uh, draw. And the last word is eat. All right. Look, believe, draw, and eat. Uh, look carefully at your life. Examine your life. Uh, what are the things that are most important? What do you value and treasure the most? What's mostly in your prayers? All right, you're looking at that, examining that. Do you find God in those areas in your life? You know, those areas that are most important. Maybe you're talking about your family. Maybe you're talking about relationships, your home, your occupation, your church. What's most important to you? You find Jesus in the middle of those things, the center of those things? How about this one? Believe. Believe that your present circumstances aren't coincidental. Your present circumstances aren't coincidence. You're going through the things you're going through for a reason. And so it, it really at the outset of today's chapter, Jesus deliberately docks his boat in a remote place so that uh, the disciples can't find food to feed people and people can't get to food. Why? Because Jesus had this thing where he would give you a little bit of food and then he'd add some faith. He'd give some food, then some faith, then some food, then some faith. And then he would give you a bone to gnaw on. And that bone was, was, was the difficult stuff. So if you're having trouble gnawing on a bone today, that bone might be in your life for the express purpose of growing you and strengthening your belief. Uh, may, maybe recently you've been in a relationship that you thought was candy-coated. Everything looked really good, and then, well, something happened. The bottom dropped out. Uh, maybe uh, you had goals and aspirations about the future. And, and what happened? Well, those goals suddenly dissipated, and here you are. You're back to the starting point. Uh, when that happens, you know, to avoid drifting, we got to believe that Jesus is at the center of those circumstances. Kevin and Kelly were my next-door neighbors a long time ago. They lived in a, we all lived together in, a, in, the, in the upstairs uh, apartments in an old house, nice old house. And uh, 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 we, we were good friends as neighbors. We got to know each other real well. They were both college students. They were going to a local Bible college, as a matter of fact. And uh, he was studying political science. She was studying medicine. Uh, and then they had goals. They had aspirations. They were going to buy a house. They were going to start a family, have, you know, 2.5 kids, and everything was going to be hunky-dory. And then she got into the, you know, the medical practice where uh, she st had an internship in that internship, she met another guy, and then she came back to Kevin and dropped the bomb that she no longer wanted their relationship to work out, and she was married, so she said, I'm filing for divorce. He was devastated. I remember I was living in a different apartment at the time. I got a knock on the door one night, and it was Kevin, and Kevin's knocking on the door. I come to the door. He says, she left me. I said, what? She left you? Left you? Really? I couldn't believe it. Uh, and so he came in, and he actually stayed with me for about three weeks. I couldn't get rid of him. <laughs> nice guy, though. But uh, he stayed there. He kept saying, I'm going to stand for God and stand for my marriage. He said, I'm 28 years old. By now, he said, I thought we'd have a house. By now, we'd have a home. We might even have our first child. He said, by now, I thought we'd have our education, and we'd be ready to go and take on life. He says, now I'm starting all over. But he says, I'm going to stand with God. I'm going to stand for my marriage. That's what he said, and he did that faithfully. She left him. He stayed faithful for a while. I don't know what he's doing today. Edwin Markham was a great poet, uh, but he wasn't great until around the time of his retirement. He'd saved up a lot of money coming around the early 60 years, 60s, and he wanted to retire, and he had comfortable stash put away, but then a good friend ran away with his money. And so Edwin, was, he was devastated, 
You know, he thought to himself, here I am, I'm 60 years old. And I, what do I got left? 60 years old, I'm flat broke. And he had trouble forgiving that guy, as you can imagine. Uh, he, he kept praying, asking God to help him forgive. Then one day he was sitting in his apartment and he was doodling circles. He tried to write poetry, but the words wouldn't come. So he's doodling circles and he kept saying, I must forgive, I must forgive, I must forgive. And finally he just poured out to God and said, God, please give me the capacity to forgive this man. And all of a sudden the words began to flow. He drew a circle that shut me out. Heretic, rebel, a thing to flout. But love and I had the wit to win. We drew a circle and took him in. His greatest poetry would follow. He found Jesus in the center of his circumstances. Uh, so the third word, the look, look at your circumstances. Believe that God's in the middle of those circumstances, even when they're, they're tough things, tough bones that you on. Draw is the third word. Verse 40, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him and I will raise him up in the last days. Those circumstances in your life are gonna accomplish one of two things. Either they're gonna stagnate your growth or they're gonna draw you into that circle where Jesus wants you. Uh, if there are circumstances in your life right now that are stagnating your growth, then, then chances are you might drift away. You might drift further away. Uh, but he says, no one can come to the Father uh, un unless, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. The word literally there, draw, means to allure by his, his grace. The last word is eat. The last word, anybody hungry right now? <laughs> Are you hungry yet? Um, you know, eating is really the symbol of faithfulness towards eternal life. Eating is a symbol of faithfulness towards eternal life. That's why every week, even though Jesus gives us this nauseating title to his sermon, eat my flesh and drink my blood. That's exactly what we do here every Sunday morning. We know we don't take that literally. Uh, the emblems here, the juice and the bread are, well, they're emblematic. They're just that, they're symbolic. But it's the fact that we keep coming back to this feast that seals the deal, seals our faithfulness week in, week out. Fritz is going to come, share in communion, and then we'll have a conclusion to the message. At this time, if we could get our communion ready. We're about to enter into the time that is the reason why Corner House is here. It's the reason why the Church of God up the street is here. It's the reason why every church that's in this town and that's celebrating the Sabbath day is here. This is the reason. And this reason was proclaimed hundreds of years before the reason was born into this world. In the book of Isaiah 53, verse 4 through 5 says, Surely he has borne our infirmities and carried our diseases. Yet we accounted him stricken, struck down by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the punishment that made us whole, and by his bruises we are healed. By his punishment we are made whole. What is it that made us divided? What is it that, that kept us from being whole to begin with? The scripture also tells us that all of us have, have been born into sin. It's a three-letter word that we tend to mention less than many four-letter words. Sin. In our society today, we have all kind of uh, big words and psychological concepts that try to explain it, but rarely does it ever get said. Why are we here?
here. Corner House is here for a reason, but why am I here? Why did I come in here this morning? I have to admit, sometimes I come in because I got to see uh, Joel or John and ask them for some help for something that's coming up in the future. Sometimes I come in because I'm thinking I need to be an example for my children. But no matter why we come in, there is really one ultimate reason we're here. It's because we were called. You're not sitting in your seat today by mistake. You have been called here today. And when we're called here, the scripture also tells us that Jesus stands at the door and knocks. He stands at that door and knocks, and anyone who opens that door, he will come in, and he will have fellowship with them. He's waiting. What could keep somebody from opening that door? What could keep somebody from sitting down and, and, and having a, a, a good meal with the Savior? It all goes back to that three-letter word, sin. What is it that causes us to go down the wrong road? It's that three-letter word, sin. When we open up that door, Jesus is faithful and true. He will come in, and he will, will sit down with us. And there's one thing that we're asked to do, and we're told that we should do. And it says, if we confess our sin, God is faithful and just and will forgive our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And when we ask for that forgiveness, we are opening the door. We are saying, Jesus, come in. I'm tired of this road. I want this road, the road with you. Isaiah also goes on to say, therefore, I will allot a time, a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out himself to death and was numbered with the transgressors. In all, and yet he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. He entered not only to, to have supper with us, but he entered into taking on the burden of our sin, the burden of that punishment. And that's what we're about to celebrate with him. So as we do this, before we take the Lord's Supper, let's just take a moment. Let's take a moment and reflect is there a sin? Is there something in my life I need to get out of the way so the Lord can truly come into my life, come into my heart, and sit down with me? Just for a moment, let's contemplate this. Let's partake in the Lord's Supper. When the hour came, he took his place at the table and the apostles with him. He said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat the Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat of it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. He said, then he took a cup, and after giving thanks, he said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. For I tell you that from now on I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. Then he took a loaf of bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And he did the same with the cup after supper, saying, This cup that is poured out for you 
and the new covenant and my blo- is my blood. But see that the, the one betrays me is with me and his hand is on the table. Let's take of the blood. And let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for calling us here to this meal. Jesus, thank you for knocking on the door of my heart. Help me that I would always open that door and that I would keep it clean. Help me that I would never hold back on anything that would get in the way of my relationship with you. Help me that your spirit would dwell within me and that it would overflow to my fellows, to my family, to my friends, and even to my enemies. Thank you, dear Lord, for doing what I could not do. You have saved me. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Amen. Thank you, Fritz. I'm blessed. Anybody ever have trouble opening these cups up? You'll be honest. <laughs> I was like sitting over here, Fritz, I didn't hear the first part of what you said because I was fighting with this lousy piece of, you know, communion cup. But, hey, um, life is hard. I want you to take the right roads. Anybody ever sin and not have fun? You ever say, I don't want to sin, sin's boring. <laughs> if God would have done that, it would have been pretty easy, right? The route would have been easier. But he says, you've got two highways you don't want to take. You don't want to take defector's highway because you can't come back from that. You really can't. Nobody does. You don't want to take drifter's highway either because it pushes you over more towards defector's highway. So the highway you want to take today is not just determined or determiners, but what I want to call determinators, because that's the way we got to be, like the terminator. We got to be determinators when it comes to choosing the route that we want to go. That's what Peter, Peter did. Peter did. Listen to this. After Jesus looked at his disciples and said, you don't want to leave too, do you? Peter turned back and he said these words, said, Lord, to whom should we go? You have the words of eternal life. You have the words. And so Peter decided to follow Jesus. In fact, this is the great commission, not the great commission, the great confession uh, in John's gospel. This is the great com- confession. Faced with the defection of the other disciples, Peter has left away his options. And his conclusion is this, there's no one better, there's no one greater than my Lord Jesus. Through trials, through hardships, through hard knocks, through headaches, through heartaches, through humility, Peter understands that the school of suffering produces the rare scholar. James says, consider it pure joy, brothers and sisters of mine, when you face trials of many kinds, because the testing of your faith develops what? Perseverance, and it must finish its course so that you will be complete, mature, and not lacking in anything, in anything, amen? Amen. So, how many of you watched the movie We Were Soldiers? I'll bring it to a close. We were so long time ago, right? And in that movie, We Were Soldiers, it was all about a paratrooper unit. They were getting ready to ship off to Vietnam, and their captain, uh, who was played by Mel Gibson, gives a rousing speech. And here's what the speech sounded like. He said, I can't promise that all of you will come back alive, But I will promise that I will be the first one to set foot on the battlefield and the last one to leave. And I will leave no one behind. We'll all come home together one way or another. I was just in the presence of a Vietnam veteran this past week, and I'm going to tell you, uh, what they went through was unbelievably cruel for anybody to be a part of and see. Mel Gibson knew. He knew his troop was about to to go into that kind of a battle. Uh, And so Peter gave a speech like that one time too. When Jesus looked at the disciples and said, all of you are going to be defectors on account of me, Peter said, no way, Lord. He says, I'm going to follow you. I won't deny you. I'll follow you all the way to death. I won't be a defector. I won't be a drifter. I won't be like one of these other disciples, one of these flunkies. No way. I'm going to stand up for you. What happened to Peter? He fell flat on his face, didn't he? He sort of became a defector. He denied Jesus three times, at least the drifter. Uh, Jesus said, Peter, if you love me, 
feed my lambs, feed my sheep. He reinstates them. So he follows Route 66. I'm holding in my, my hands, you know this. This is Route 66. 66 of the most amazing books you will ever read combined into one, the word of God. That's the route we're to follow. That's the route that the other disciples follow. Listen, as I mentioned earlier, 4,988 of them drifted off but 12 of them stood firm. That means there's a chance that of uh, of this group here, we might follow Highway 666. That's the devil's highway. The devil says, that's the road I want you to take. I'm going to put roadblocks, pit pit bulls, pit bulls. (laughs) I'm going to make it hard on you uh, to follow Route 66. But when faced with a choice, we don't want to take deserters highway, defectors highway. We don't want to take drifters highway. We want to take determined highway. In fact, we want to be determinators uh, when it comes to our walk and our life with with Jesus Christ. Will we stand with him? Will we stand firm? Uh, His words are often strange and dangerous. Sometimes, like Peter, I follow him because it makes sense. There are times when nothing makes sense. And yet one thing we do know, Jesus has the words of life. His words don't always align with our reason, and yet they tower over our existence. Would you pray with me today? Lord, I I know that, uh, Father, your will be done in this world. It's going to be done. And Lord, yet you have reached out to people like me, and you've said, I'm going to trust you. I'm going to give you my word. I'm going to put it in your heart. I'm going to put it in front of you. I'm going to put you to the test. I'm going to give you an opportunity. I'm going to give you a a dismay too. And I'm going to see how you work out life through those hard times. And then we'll see. We We don't want you to take defector road. We don't want you to take drifters highway. We want you to take determinators highway. We want you to live faithfully. And that's the, that's the message of Christ to us today. Uh, and it's the message that I bring before you as we close this, this sermon out. Uh, if today you would, for the first time, give Jesus your life, opportunity just to say, I just humbly come before you. I want to make Jesus Lord. Maybe you just say, in my life, I've, I've been close to defecting. I've been close to drifting. Lord, I want to come back into a right relationship with you. I want to be determined. I want to be a determinator. I want to make a difference. This is an invitation. Walk forward as we sing. Would you please stand and sing with us?
this time we could be seated. We're going to have our prayers for those that are sick, those that are in need of an extra dose of the Lord's loving hand. On our list today, we have brothers and sisters that are facing chemotherapy. We have uh, people that are are just having sickness and difficulty breathing. We have people that are facing surgery. We have some brothers and sisters that are in critical condition with cardiac arrest. We have one of our dear brothers who's sick but not eating. And we also have those that have loved ones that are hospitalized and don't know why such challenges. Let's lift these all up to our Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we know that you love your children. We know that not a sparrow falls without your knowledge. We know that you numbered the, the number of the hairs on our head before we were born and you have a purpose for every one of us. We're lifting up our brothers and sisters now for your healing and for your grace. You've called us to the determined road, the narrow road, but you also promised that you would be there with us. And we pray that there's an extra dose of your presence with each one of those that are on our list. That amidst the turmoil, the, the strife and the struggle, that they will see you there with them and know that by your stripes they are healed and they, they know that all things work together for good for those that love the Lord. Help us as their brothers and sisters that we would lift them up continuously, that we would reach out a helping hand, that we would give an encouraging word and that if they are weeping that we would weep with them. Thank you for calling us into your family. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. 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 Would you please stand and sing with us? Where you go, I'll go. Where you stay, I'll stay. When you move, I'll move. I will fall. Serve, I'll serve. If this life. 